So with all that, with all those experiences that I had with mushrooms, um, I think I was just like, man, like how do, uh, and somebody, I'm, I'm somebody who has a background in, in organizing specifically prison abolition work. Like I've worked with critical resistance and the youth justice coalition, which are both based out of LA. And I was like, how do I get this information and make this information accessible to those spaces and exciting? And like, how do I just like tell everybody about this? And that's kind of when I came to the conclusion, like I just need to make work about this and I need to make like spaces, create conversations like this where people can, can have access to science and can also like go through that process of me like well maybe I'm a mycologist too and like not be shy about embracing that within themselves um especially for folks who like who myself like I went to like you know schools that were like underfunded and had a really hard time and was like really shy about science and like kind of like scared about science so I'm like I'm just like really at this point right now where I'm like, how do I create accessibility and how do, how do we go past those barriers? Um, yeah, and with on that note, I'm, I will end with saying that I am like in the thick of my studies, of my mushroom studies. And I'm, I'm just excited. I, I'm excited to be able to talk to William today. Part of, part of what inspired this conversation with William is that I'm a teacher at a visiting faculty at CalArts and one of the things one of the things that I have found the most for uh, the most transformative to my practice when I was a student at CalArts was that we had these like one-on-one -on -one, uh, independent study sessions where like the the way we were studying together could go anywhere and it could go to any of these areas and so like yeah and so today was like very much inspired by that by those types of classes and yes and and I really want to like if folks want to come check out some of the work that I'm creating around the mushrooms like please come through tomorrow or shoot me an email we can do like a I can send you like an online tour from I'm shooting these like VR photos of the the studio tomorrow so I can share those with folks too Thank you, and we can move on to William now. What's up, everybody? How's it going? <clears throat> well, I'm Will, and um, I'm just here to vibe out and answer some questions. And you know, um, I have some really cool pictures to share with you guys. Um, but yeah, I've been you know practicing citizen science here. Um, I'm well. This is a new home, but. I've been practicing citizen science out of the homes that I've been living in for like eight or nine years now. <clears throat> and I've been involved with mushrooms for the most part of that time. Um, I have first, well, I can't say first and foremost, but I have for the most part been um, involved with permaculture design or whole systems design science. Um, and that has led me to touch a lot of different aspects of, of, um, of, of different systems that are necessary to maintain human life um, in the home and also in the community because my work has extended outside of my home into um, the community in the town that I'm living in. Um, and for me, like mushrooms have always been interesting for me because like particularly like um, psychoactive species or, or I wouldn't be here if I wasn't able to like change the way I was thinking about the world with with those kinds of mushrooms. Um, but it wasn't particularly, there wasn't particularly like a heavy focus on mushrooms for me initially. Um, initially, a lot of the science work and a lot of the, the work that I do now started around gardening and out of necessity. So like Gloria was mentioning, like a lot of this just ends up happening out of necessity. Like I was struggling, you know, and I needed to eat and I had a family to feed. So like I had to figure out how to feed my family good food um, so I was growing food um, and I was growing really nutrient dense food. I wanted to grow the most nutrient dense food that I could. So I was growing a lot of different types of food and I was growing mushrooms and I was growing algae and I was putting everything on the internet because I wanted to share other with other people that might be in my same situation, how that they can feed themselves with not a lot of money to set up these systems that can produce food that has a high nutrient value. So that was my main focus because um, I didn't want my little kid to be malnourished because I couldn't afford food that had good nutritive qualities because I knew the food at the grocery stores wasn't going to be of the quality that I knew was necessary to make a human brain of the capacity that I know is capable of. 
Um, so I wanted to figure out how to most affordably grow the most nutrient dense foods and share it with as many people as I could, because I wanted, I was tired of seeing humans with incredible potential, not being able to experience the full capacity of their potential due to lack of nutrition and lack of education. So I wanted to take care of the nutrition first for myself and for my family. Um, but everybody only liked my mushroom videos that I was putting online. Like I was doing everything online. I was posting algae, gardening, permaculture, insects, like science at home, whatever, biofuels, whatever. Like, but only people were liking my mushroom stuff. And then I'd be like spun out meditating and stuff. And I'd be like, the mushroom stuff's going to trend. The mushroom stuff's going to get trendy. Cause like, I'd be like projecting and trying to figure out what the patterns were. And I was like, mushrooms are going to get trendy. Mushrooms are going to get trendy. And I was like, all right, I'm going to have to be ahead of the curve. And then I just started a mushroom business whenever I realized that that's what, what was going to be ha happening. And I made a successful mushroom business. And then I've, now I'm playing around with all my other things. Um, but yeah, if you have any, uh, if you wanted to get into some of these questions, I can go ahead and um, share my screen with you guys. I got lots of cool stuff to share and we can continue on this conversation. Cool, yeah. So I think we can get into the first question, which is actually related slightly to the things you're talking about, like, and that I mentioned, like, you know, like surviving and, um, and how surviving brought you to mushrooms and it brought me to mushrooms. And I, I kind of feel like uh, on this train of thinking, like I think of like mushrooms as being, uh, I think of them as being as survivors. So I'm gonna ask you, can you tell me the survival story of the mushroom? And when I say the survivor story, I'm thinking about how fungi beans were some of the first beans to traverse the earth's land and how they actually contributed to making the landscape habitable for others to traverse it to. Or I am also thinking about how it is said that the first living thing that emerged from the Hiroshima blasted Japanese landscape was a Matsutake mushroom. So with this in mind, can you tell me the survival story of the mushroom? And I guess here specifically one like thing that I wanna clarify is that I'm really interested in within my own practice and just in general as a listener as, and as somebody who hears and listens to stories, I'm really interested in the story that non-human actors of the world are telling and especially the story that the mushroom is telling us and especially the story of surviving. Wow, you asked one of my favorite subjects. I love that. Um, well, there was a couple of years ago, I was, I was in a meditative state and I came to the understanding that algae and fungi are the biological alpha and omega of, of life, anywhere that life exists in the universe. They are the biological alpha and omega. Um, and I know you asked particularly about mushrooms, but I think algae is just important to add into the mix because I think that those two like dance a, a beautiful waltz through the universe. Um, but uh, life on life on land, I mean, it emerged of, of them both, uh, both algae. And I say algae is the alpha because algae is the first photosynthetic organism. And then fungi is the omega because it's the first organism of, of large scale de decomposition. Um, and them together are what created, they terraformed this planet. Algae created the oxygen necessary for fungi to live outside of water. So, so it wasn't until algae created enough oxygen in the atmosphere that fungi and algae could step out of the water together. And once algae created the atmosphere necessary for fungi to come out of the water, as they grew together, as they experimented with prototype life, like lichens. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of Prototaxides, um, which was the ancient um, mushrooms that were like over eight feet tall. Um, they were the tallest things on the land. And even though eight feet tall is not that tall, but they would be that something that tall when there's nothing tall on the land would be something that would be attracting lightning, which I find to be very interesting, very exciting, if you understand what I'm saying, like a, as a energy being very exciting. Um, but these, these were prototypes of, of, of life. This was life experimenting with, with forms and, and what works to be able to make the most out of the um, space that it was existing in. Um, so a lot of people thought that Prototaxides was a giant mushroom, um, but I believe it to be a proto tree. Um, it was experiment at trees. Um, it was algae and fungi living together. Um, and we still see lichens today. Um, lichens were 
were the soil creators. We see them now on rocks. I don't know if you ever have noticed or if anybody that doesn't know what a lichen is, but um, on rocks, you'll see patches. They're usually like blue or flaky looking. Um, sometimes they're different colors. Um, but this is algae and fungi together eating rocks. Um, so they ate rocks. And like we, we understand time in such a weird fr time frame because as human beings living uh, within a hundred year lifespan and living with a nine to five work schedule from a day to day life and, and weekends and everything blocked out this way, um, our perception of time is very distorted. Um, but when we can understand that the lichen over hundreds and maybe even thousands of years is literally eating a rock and making soil, it's just a, a really interesting perspective to take on time. Um, but yeah, together, algae and fungi became the first organisms to come on land. And when we understand, as Gloria was saying, that um, fungi have more related with humans than they do with plants, this is true um, because Animalia branches off of the kingdom fungi. We're both part of a larger kingdom called Apistacantha. Um, so this is also why I believe that algae and fungi together are the alpha and omega of life because together they can terraform a planet. They can create an atmosphere. They can terraform a planet that has water and then they can make plants and animals because algae evolves into plants on land and fungi evolves into animals on land. So these two organisms can exist in the vacuum of space. They've been proven to be able to exist in the vacuum of space and they can terraform planets. I think that I think it's panspermia, if anybody ever has heard of that. I think that algae and fungi are panspermia. Um, but not only that, they've been able to exist through every extinction event that's ever happened on the planet. And they've even caused extinction events. Um, the first mass oxygenation, it killed almost everything on the planet. Before there was oxygen in the atmosphere, everything that was on the planet that was living on the planet was living in an atmosphere that was completely different. So the first oxygenation event that happened by algae was a big mass extinction. Um, and then every single mass extinction since then, algae and fungi have been there not only to survive, but to recuperate and regenerate a new ecosystem. And I think this is something beautiful to understand as we move forward. And as I close this last little um, statement to answer your first question, is that it's important to regenerate and not sustain. Um, I think sustainability is cool, but I think it's important to regenerate things that are broken before we sustain things. And I like to understand how algae and fungi come in and regenerate after things are broken. Like we're not trying to sustain things that are broken, we're trying to regenerate and then move on forward. Um, so I think that that's a great symbol um, to utilize um, throughout time because we're, we're working with organisms that are timeless. Um, they speak in languages that are timeless. These are the most ancient of organisms. They exist from the beginning, they'll exist through into the future. So if you can learn how to speak the languages that they're speaking, you can tap into something that's beyond time. Beautiful, so inspiring. Um, my next question for you is, the mushroom's ingenuity to survive is an admirable trait of the mushroom that we humans can look up to. I am wondering if in your study of mushrooms, you have encountered other character traits in, the, in mushrooms and fungi um, that humans would socially and spiritually benefit from emulating. Wow. Um, you know, I'm, con I'm consistent. I'm constantly learning from mushrooms. Um, I think, I think a, a, the, one of the biggest parts of my own work personally is learning the language of the fungi, which is something that I've really, really, hopefully this loads my computers being all slow. Um, it's something I've really been, uh, trying to figure out for a while, but I feel like living in the United States, it's really, really hard to slow down enough to, uh, to speak in languages of, of nature. Um, because, because this culture and this area that I'm living in is so demanding of me monetarily to maintain, um, life. For, for me, my son and my partner, um, my brain is constantly working on other things besides learning how to speak to mushrooms. So I've only been able to learn little, little, little bit of language. Like, like my, um, my ability to speak to mushrooms, even though I'm like recognized as like an expert mycologist, even though I'm as a, an amateur mycologist, because I didn't pay a bunch of money to go to school to learn this. So like, I don't even feel 
Like, I don't even feel like I have the right to like say that I'm a mycologist when there's people that have spent so much money and so much time to gain those, those accreditations, you know? And like, I don't take any like offense in not being able to, to tack, to, to put that name with myself. Um, and like, and if you want to, you can, I know plenty of people that do, and I have nothing against that. That's just something in my own. Um, but it's like, I still feel like I am, am remedial in my linguistic skills with, with, with these, with these organisms. Um, but I've, I've learned a little bit here and there, you know, there's like, they're, they're very non-judgmental, you know, um, they are territorial, like, but they do work with each other sometimes, but a lot of them are very territorial. Like they will fight each other. Um, and how, does, fight how, e how do mushrooms fight each other? Can you expand a bit on that? All right. This log right here that you're looking at, um, I have to be very careful about how I maintain these logs before I introduce the mushrooms to them. Because if these logs are laying on the ground or if they get wet or they get wind blown on them, another type of fungus might try and grow in there. So whenever I introduce my mushroom there, they'll fight with each other inside of the log. The same way humans will fight with each other over land. Um, except instead of using weapons made of, instead of using tools made of, of stone or guns, um, they use enzymes and metabolites and acid. Um, so they like fling enzymes and acid and metabolites at each other inside of the log and fight each other until one of them wins. And then one of them will either eat the other one or they'll claim their territories and they'll live on different sides of the log. Um, but yeah, sometimes they fight with each other. Um, but for the most part, they're very non-judgmental. Um, I was thinking, like thinking about this, the like fighting with each other, like I'm thinking about that. And because like even within my own studies, I feel like there's elements of me like romanticizing mushrooms. Um, and I feel like that happens like a lot within the mushroom community and like, oh, mushrooms. Yeah years and very much I do like there's elements of me that do believe that but at the same time I do think that they're complicated beings who actually you know some mushrooms are poisonous and some mushrooms uh like you know get into the bodies of insects and like control them and consume them and that can be seen as a very negative a negative like quality but at the same time I feel like one of the things I've been thinking about is like oh well what are the relationships we have in like there's like are we in a right relationship or are we like in the wrong relationship and like mm -hmm. perhaps like within this like element of this thing that you're talking about fighting it's like perhaps I'm seeing it as like oh like we're not in right relationship because you're like one one organism is like saying like well you're taking up too much space right or you're like consuming like you're too close to me and the resources or whatever so yeah, um, and, and just because like thinking about mushrooms in general, there's very like relational beings and they're all, they're like constantly like in relationship within the world around each other and like very aware of the relationships. They're mm -hmm. like literally like, moving because of these relationships and everything and forming well, I mean, their like, body like, around this. Yeah, I mean, like there's like mushrooms that like depend on trees and trees that depend on the mushrooms relationship with their roots. And there's like, like, I mean, there's fungi that like, I mean, there's whole organisms that would be able to eat the foods that they eat if there wasn't fungi living in their intestines. Like goats can't eat all that crazy stuff if there wasn't fungi living in their stomachs. Like cows wouldn't be able to digest the things that they digest if there wasn't fungi living in their stomachs. So like there's all sorts of these like um, dependencies. I mean, and there's mushrooms that literally farm bacteria and there's ants that farm mushrooms. And like, there's all these like, I mean, that's why I, I, I named my business Mycosymbiotics because like, there's so many of these symbiotic relationships. I mean, every single mushroom has associations with other organisms and they depend on each other. And, and for those reasons, they protect each other. And like, this is one of the reasons why mushrooms are so medicinal because they're acting to protect the organisms and the organelles that they depend on, which is in, in, in a whole system, it's all of the organisms acting in conjunction to maintain the ecosystem. So they're exposed to the same viruses that we are they're exposed to the same ecological contaminants that we are. And they're like, well, hey, 
if that if that deer gets sick and it stops eating me and spreading my spores, you know, we might be screwed. We might be able to not spread our spores that far. So maybe we should produce some compounds to help this deer. Maybe that's not even the way they're thinking. Maybe they're just like, let's protect ourselves. And because they're so from similar to us, because we evolved from them, the compounds that they use to protect themselves are beneficial for us as well. Who knows? But I do think that they're acting. I do, I do think that fungi act to protect the ecosystem and the organelles that they have relationships with. I mean, it makes it only makes sense. Like if they have an if they have a relationship with this tree and this tree was dying off. That means that they might not exist ever again, so they would act to protect it. And even with the cordyceps, that's one I've been trying to figure out too here in Pennsylvania. Um, what's the ecological function of the cordyceps? Because they're maintaining a, a, a species of insect that if it was left unchecked, would terrorize the oak trees in the whole Northwest and Mid-Atlantic. And they move, the cordyceps move different years. Like, so it's really, really, like this is the thing I'm trying to tell people to slow slow down. Like I would never be able to see the ecosystem in this perspective if I was stuck in a nine to five job and working with my schedule and my brain in a schedule. Like I've been looking at an ecosystem over years. Like it takes a lot of time of like sitting in a spot and looking at something. Um, but I've been watching the cordyceps for years trying to figure out um, just like where they're, where they're going, what are they moving, how are they moving and I really do think that they're helping to maintain an ecosystem in a holism, in a holistic state, um, and keeping these insects from like devastating these tree species. So I think that all of these different organisms are playing their function. They're like critical little key pieces. And whenever we knock one of them out, then we start to see big ripples and effects down the line. Mm -hmm. um, my, and this is, you. I mean, you kind of have briefly mentioned bits and pieces about this question but maybe here you can do it like in a coherent unified way um but my question is the mushroom that you primarily work with is the cordyceps mushroom can you tell me about your relationship with this mushroom and can you tell me about the relationship of this mushroom in general with people with the general population like what is the relationship of this mushroom with people and humanity on a chemical, social, economic, and historical level, et cetera, et cetera. All right, let's, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm skipping through these too fast for you guys, but I'm trying to get to the cordyceps stuff, which I believe is in here somewhere. Yeah, there's a little bit of cordyceps stuff in here. All right, so these are what the cordyceps that I grow look like. Um, this is cordyceps militaris. Um, cordyceps militaris is one of the most successful cordyceps in the world because it's capable of growing on over 50 species of insects. Um, most cordyceps only have one insect association. Um, so this is, this is a pretty big deal. And I think because of how many different species of insects that they're able to grow on, um, it, it allows us to have this ability to be able to cultivate them because they're so readily available. They're so readily, um, uh, they're so ready to jump on, on different food sources. Um, so we've been able to, um, whenever I first did it, I was kind of like um, um, deconstructing the nutritional profile of an insect um, uh, with, with foods that I could find. Um, um, so I was using rice and like uh, nutritional yeast or like, at first I was using like baby formula and stuff, like just like trying different things, um, mostly with rice as a matrix or like as a substrate for it all. Um, and I was able to start growing these. And then in 2017, I published the first literature on um, cordyceps cultivation in English in the world. Um, and I just I just kept playing around with experimenting um, with how to grow these things. I mean, you're literally like, I mean, you talk about speaking to an organism, you're literally coaxing it into to producing its sexual organ in a jar. Like, you got to really be able to know how to speak to an organism if you want to do that. Like, that's some that's some really in, that's intimate, like. Does this mushroom normally, because I know it grows out of insects sometimes, does in the wild only exclusively grow out of insects or does it grow out of other things too? Well, this black one here, this is related. It's a related species. This one is Talipocladium ophioglossoides. And as far as I know, I was the first person in the world to cultivate that one in vitro. And since then, I've seen only two other people do it. Um, but that one's really interesting because 
it has neurological regenerative properties similar to lion's mane. So a lot of people can look at this one like a nootropic substance because um, it can increase cognitive function, but it also has benefits for prostate health. So like that's super, super awesome for men's health. But that one grows, you can see it's growing on a truffle. That one's a, that one grows on a false truffle in the Laphomyces genus. It's like a deer truffle. Um, it's not like a good gourmet truffle. Um, for those of you that don't know, there's a lot, a lot of truffle species in the world, and there's only like a small percentage of them that are the gourmet types. Um, but there's a lot of different ones and truffle cultivation, super, super cool. If you have land, I would definitely recommend looking into that. Um, but yeah, so cordyceps, there are different types of like uh, mushrooms that are related to cordyceps that grow on like tr on other fungus, but nothing that does like all only on insects or another fungus. There's not, it never really grows on anything else. And, um, and yeah, and just like, um, you know, like I, part of my question was like on a historical social level, like how these mushrooms specifically have related or people, how people have related with them. And like, I guess mushrooms back to them. But I guess part of that question is because I feel like, historically in certain parts of the world not everywhere um there has been um certain parts of the world that really associated mushrooms with like death darkness like decomposition and like in the negative way in the way where like oh mushrooms are evil you can take them you can die um but this was like a very specific like relationship and narrative to mushrooms um yeah there's obviously other ones that other people had but I'm curious if like, you know of any of these like historical relationships that people have had with this mushroom specifically. Um, or like folk tales, you know, there's sometimes like folk tales around mushrooms and stuff like that. Yeah, there, I mean, there are some tales about this mushroom. I'm, I'm sorry, if you wouldn't mind, I gotta, I just realized my computer is about to die. Oh yeah, go, go for it, grab your charger. I'm gonna grab my charger real quick. Yeah, I'll be right back, one second. Laurie, I want to say that um, we do want to leave some room for questions. Right. We do have them. Yeah, of course. What, like, when do you want to start the questions at? What time? All right, I'm here. Say in about 10 minutes. Okay, sounds good. Okay, so the question was about historical use of cordyceps mushrooms? No, 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 like folk tales around this mushroom or just like the historical social relationship that has been documented around this mushroom. All right, so there's not much documented with this mushroom. Um, the documentation around this mushroom is more um, from, the documentation of this mushroom comes more from Tibetan, the Tibetan plateau, uh, but not of Cordyceps militaris, it's of Ophiocordyceps sinensis, um, which is a different Cordyceps that has more traditional use. Um, and there's folklore around it of like yaks, um, the herdsmen of the yaks uh, would be eating it in the springtime. Um, and then the yaks herdsmen would like, um, would started to try them and realize of the energy potentials of it. And then they would even like put them in the yak milk and it would make the organisms on the, from the, um, cause you pull the, the or, or, oviocordyceps sinensis, you pull the insect out of the dirt and they eat the whole thing with the insect because the insect is full of mycelium, but they would put that into the yak milk and the organisms on it would make it ferment into yogurt. And then it would be extracted the cordyceps mushroom stuff into the, uh, compounds into the yogurt. Um, so there's like some interesting stuff around there, but like, I find the Tibet, the, I find the Tibetan plateau, like super interesting and i'll go off on tangents about all of the crazy organisms that evolved there and why cordyceps and cannabis were so 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 cool in the tibetan plateau like there should be a whole presentation on just that alone i think that's there's a i think there's a particular reason why the people in that mountain got so high and so hippie and so freaking awesome um but yeah that's a whole different story for another time cool yeah um i I'm going to end on this question and this question is like kind of like a question that I'm 
asking because partly this is like something that I'm like, oh, this is whenever I embark into a new like project or a new thing that I'm into, often like my sense of like organizing is always like, how can I bring this or make this relevant to the communities I've worked with, which is like my background was like in prison abolition work. Um, so lately I've been like asking myself like, whoa, whoa, like how does this mushroom and all these things and all these ideas around mushrooms and mushrooms in general, like, like, what do they, like, what do they mean to, like, the prison abolition movement or to, like, community justice movements that I've worked with? And so, yeah, I asked myself that, and today I ask you, like, what is the role of fungi and the global mo movement towards social justice? Um, one moment, I think I have something very particularly the answer to that question, if you don't mind. Um, I haven't touched that one in a minute, but I know it's in here. Uh, I'm sorry. I don't, I had a, I have a presentation somewhere in my life, somewhere called fighting social injustice with mycology. And it'd be the perfect answer to this question right now, but I don't know where it is. My apologies. Um, but, uh, you know, I think that, I think that because mycology is so accessible as a science to anybody that doesn't really have any background in science at all, like myself, I dropped out of high school whenever I was 16 years old. I have no formal education in biology, m m like mycology, anything like that. Like, um, so I think that um, I mean, look at this. There's an 11 year old girl right there. She was, I got her cloning cordyceps within a day of, of one of my classes. So like, I think of how like um, easy it is to get engaged with mycology is one of the ways that it can help fight social injustice and how, um, how affordable it is to get started. So like whenever I first started playing around with mycology, like a lot of the labs were all like big and expensive and like probably look like Paul Stamets lab. He, their labs are like multi-million dollar labs and his lab's beautiful. But like, if I saw his lab first, cause like back in the day, the only mushroom classes you could go to were the ones that he was doing. And his lab is big and expensive and nice. And I never took his classes, but if I was to go take a class like that, I'd be like, well, I never could do this. I can't even like afford to pay my rent. I'm barely getting $600 on a two week basis. That's for real life, for real life. Like I know people know that's for real life. That's a, that's crazy that people are trying to live off of $600 on a bi-weekly basis. So like, I'm like, how am I supposed to start growing mushrooms? Right? Like, but I could, I figured it out to grow mushrooms when I was making $600 on a bi-weekly basis with a little baby that I had to put diapers on and a partner like that I was living with, like I figured out how to do it. So I was like, I mean, maybe not everybody has the drive or the be able to have to teach themselves the way that I can. But the fact that I was able to do it with no money, it shows that anybody like a couple people could come together and put a couple heads together and figure out how to grow mushrooms anywhere. And I think that um, me being able to be the chameleon that I am because I've lived damn near everywhere in the world at this point like i've lived all over the united states because my dad was in the military i've lived in a lot of different countries because my mom worked for the department of agriculture foreign trade services so like i've lived so many places where i was growing up that like i can just go so many places and change the way that i speak to speak to those people where i'm at and i can dress different ways like i literally i speak for i speak for um what is the name of this college every time it escapes me cornell i do i speak for cornell small farms program but then i go teach in inner city baltimore and inner city atlanta i don't talk the same way when i go to e either of those places because they wouldn't hear me the same if i spoke the same if i spoke to the people at cornell the way that i speak to the people in atlanta and the same way i speak to people at cornell they wouldn't hear it you know you have to change up the linguistics so i think it's important um, that there are people like me that are going around also being able to represent the science because it makes it a, 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 a digestible. It makes it like, oh, that guy's doing it. I like, like I so many times when I was younger looked for somebody that looked like me doing something to feel like it was appropriate for me to be able to do it. Like, and that's just the way it was. And that was where I was coming from with my, with my, um, with my limited belief in myself. 
my limited self-esteem. I didn't believe in myself enough to be able to do something on my own if I didn't see somebody like myself doing it. And that's just me. I'm not saying like that's how it is for other people, but I do think that people find encouragement in being able to see somebody that looks like them doing these things. Like this is one of my things I was teaching um, at a permaculture action day at an urban farm in inner city Atlanta. This might not look like it, but on the other side, that was a hood, that was a neighborhood. Like behind is a creek, but in the other side is a whole neighborhood with a lot of neighborhood stuff going on, like in in Atlanta. And so like, you know, like at the, go, I don't know. I, I mean, I think that, I think, I think that I think hearing you too, like um, William makes me think about like, uh, I was just talking about, somebody was telling me, you know, connected to what you said earlier that mushrooms are getting like trendy and they were talking about that in juxtaposition to like the plant trend, like the millennial plant trend or whatever. Uh, but we were talking about how like, uh, the way I feel like I, I think I said something about like, well, I think what's cool about the trend that's growing within mushrooms is that like mushrooms is something that you like right away from my like feeling and understanding of it is like something that you right away have to do in community. Like, you know, you when to go foraging and to learn how to forage, like you don't do that alone with a book. You like go with somebody who is he, William, are you still here? Oh, yeah, you're here. Go get him a shower right now. Oh, yeah, somebody else. William, are you still here? Maybe somebody else is here, but William froze. Okay, um, I think we maybe lost William for a second, but it looks like he he's on uh, his phone. <laughs> oh, is he? Yeah, he got off for a second and, and he's, he, I did let him back in. <laughs> okay, I see, I see. So, uh, perhaps. Oh, there he goes. He's back. Okay, great. Perhaps. Oh, yeah, go for it, Asuka. Well, perhaps this is a time to open it up to our guests and see if they want to uh, ask a question to you or to William or to both of you. So uh, you're all muted. Now you can unmute and you can put it into a uh, gallery view so we can see each other, but um, feel free to ask a question. If you have a question. I have a question. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, yes. My question is um, related to my relationship recently with uh, medications that I take for autoimmune disease and finding a balance with, you know, I guess through, through mushrooms, I've been thinking about just um, holistic medications and, um, or holistic um, plants and um, how I can integrate that um, for healing, you know, for, for myself and, and also just to share um, these benefits. Like I'm just trying to basically begin to educate myself of other things that are out there that I know are helping that perhaps aren't um, researched so much and not implemented obviously in medicine and with the doctors I see. So my question is um, if you have any direct like recommendations of, I guess, uh, types of mushrooms that assist in, in, you know, I guess, pain relief or inflammation. I don't know if there's, I know Gloria said, perhaps there's something you can email me, but overall, that's just my question and kind of want to get started on, on researching more. So if you have any books or more knowledge that maybe William can share, um, I'm interested. Um, can you guys hear me on here? I'm back on my computer. All right, cool. Um, I would recommend checking out the fungal pharmacy by Robert Rogers. Um, you know, in the United States, you have to be very, very careful about um, what you say in regards to medical recommendations. Um, oh, right. I don't run a business where oh, I sell things anymore, right. but but I still cannot give anybody medical advice. It's just right. like I I can't. But there's a, there's great books. But like I can research pharmacy. it myself, and that's like a good yeah. start, right? Yeah, the fungal pharmacy, you will literally lose your mind. It is amazing. Okay. It's so good. Yeah. 
So it gives me good um, starting point. Yeah. So, um, oh, geez, what is it called? Uh, look up. All right. So when you, the, the guy that wrote the fungal pharmacy, Robert Rogers, he yeah. just released another book specifically on mushrooms with human clinical trials associated with it. So, cool. cause the fungal okay. pharmacy was like a lot of animal studies, but the new one is with specifically with human clinical trials. Yeah. Perfect. So I can get started on that. Thank you so much. Yeah, no look problem. he's in Canada. Movie. It's easier for him because he's in Canada. Um, and yeah. uh, a lot of the studies are done out of Asia because we're not allowed to do it here because there's too many people making money on pharmaceuticals. That's why. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. I think like a bit of a spin off to this question is like, because you're talking about like holistic health and I think a part of holistic health is to like our surroundings and the people around us and like it's inseparable like and I feel like thinking about the mushroom because the mushroom is very much like you know the, it's connected and it's like it's moving the resources around so yeah and I know you have a background in social permaculture which is like for me like the more social health the design of like the social space would you talk a little bit about health in like the community idea through the values of permaculture well i mean i think that like i might be so radical but like geez um i think that i think that it's important that that a community cares about itself and in a community caring about itself it means you know your neighbors and you care about your neighbors which means you care about their health and you know what's going on like and like, that's just so radical, especially where I live in central Pennsylvania. Like, oh my gosh, like what I just said, I might be a communist. Oh my, geez. It's like, it's like that. Like why? I don't know why. How did I end up here? Like, how did I end up here thinking that caring about somebody and like, you know, being like taking care of your neighbor would be such a like crazy idea. But um, I think, I think that's where the help, where that comes into play. Um, back whenever I was like, whenever I was 21, I was 22, I tried, I went over, I was 22, I attempted to run for uh, mayor here in New Cumberland, Pennsylvania, um, because you only have to be 18 to run for mayor. And I was like, hey, that'd be super cool if a young 22 year old black kid was the mayor of a conservative area in Pennsylvania. That'd be awesome, right? So cool. And like, I came with all these like ideas for like um, green jobs. And I was like, I'm not going to ask for any of your tax money. I've made enough jobs in this community that I can employ people to implement the social designs necessary to take care of um, 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 aspects of our social systems that we're lacking in and employ people at the same time, not asking for any tax money and doing it and creating revenue, creating jobs and utilize and, and buying up uh, uh, these, these properties that keep getting bought up by people that don't own, that don't live in the area. Everybody has an issue with this. Like people keeps buying land because nobody in the area has any money. So the people come in with money from outside of the area, they buy the properties, they turn them into whatever they want. They don't care about the area because they don't live here. And then they just do whatever they want. They make an apartment building, then they then they don't even own it. And the tenants are like, where the heck's the landlord? We need the landlord man's out in like Hawaii somewhere just fucking off because they have the money to just go buy properties and do whatever they want. That's just the way it works around in these areas. And everybody ends up just working in random Amazon warehouses. And then the rest of the the area goes to shit. Like we've had so many issues with our wastewater treatment facilities because so many people keep coming in here and building all these apartment buildings and nobody's built investing in the infrastructure for the area that's here because everybody just wants to make the money and get quick, rich quick, but not realizing that there's no money here and nobody's investing in infrastructure. So every time somebody flushes a new toilet, we're, we're uh, doing combined sewage overflow and then there's dumping millions and millions of gallons of raw sewage into the water. We already in 2015, the, the uh, uh, Camp Hill, mayor got fined for dumping hundreds of millions of gallons of raw sewage into two creeks that families literally put their children into. It's insane that these people just want to make so much money and not even care about these infrastructure. It's not all about this money. Like it's ridiculous. But so like I came up with all these different ways that we can create these jobs and, and utilize this marginal land because every single city has marginal land that it costs the city taxpayer dollars for them to go and maintain it, like mow the lawns and like um, stuff like that, because every single city has places that they can't build buildings on it um, because it's not, not stable or something for building buildings like every city has it. There's places that's just the city has to maintain just to maintain it. Um, and those those are the areas that the that people need to utilize 
um, the marginal land to start building up on. And then uh, there's, uh, I, have a, I have a design for it. I have a whole design for it. It was called Sunny Yards New Cumberland Sink. And it was like um, f- uh, free clinic, small, tiny homes, um, um, operating with a community garden and held in community commons so that the people operating the garden own it. Then they run a farmer's market there and sell the produce back to the rich people because the rich people like to buy organic produce. So like it's a whole system that maintains itself and funds the free clinic for people to be able to maintain health in it. But then the people maintain it. Once people are working together and caring for each other, it, it, it becomes a different mindset. And whenever you're not like working the nine to five and you can see time differently and you can actually like literally spend time caring about each other, people can't even see each other for more than face value anymore because we're moving so fast. People only see you for what they want in you anymore. They can't even see you as you are. So how is somebody supposed to care about your health when they can only see you for, oh, that person's hot or that person's sexy or like, how can I get, um, how can I learn how to like um, mushrooms from this person? How can I learn how to make money from this person the way that they make money? Like that's all that people even see each other for anymore. So how can they see that you're sick? How can they see that you need help? How can they see that you're about to kill yourself? Like, it's really crazy like that. It's really like that. So like, we really need to be able to slow down to be able to see people for more than just this face value that we're looking at each other at right now. And I think that like, I think that just like taking the time to take, I think this coronavirus thing was probably a really good step for everybody that's been able to survive it. Just take a step back. Like people really don't even have jobs to be going to right now. Like so many people in the United States really don't even have jobs to be going to right now. So I think uh, the first step is just really just, plant some seeds outside springtime is coming right now plant some seeds outside grow some food grow some mushrooms literally on paper i'm putting out videos every single week on how you can grow mushrooms on things that are literally free like every single week i'm putting out videos for anybody in the world i'm I'm, I'm speaking in languages and giving materials that anybody in the world can find for almost for free and grow these mushrooms and feed yourself and take a step back and just take a step Feed yourself and use that money and that time that you would have spent on that food to take a step back and take some time to spend on yourself. I know I sound like a crazy person right now, but it's like, Jesus, what is going on? Like, what is happening in this world right now is like, we got to really slow down. We really, really got to slow down. That's what the mushroom's been telling me, at least. (laughs) Thank you for that. I think. I I have a few questions. Um, I've really appreciated this. Thank you. And Gloria, I think I have your audio book of the mushroom at the end of the world from Shabina. (laughs) I've shared with many people. Um, But I I similarly feel like um, I've been working with Ana Singh up in Santa Cruz and have been working on a a film essay about foraging and I've been thinking about abolition a lot too and also understand sort of the over idealization of mushrooms and um, have been thinking about mutual aid and and carbon transfers underground and I definitely like to hear more about abolition and mushrooms from you and what you're thinking about. Um, And another question I had for William and for you is I've joined like the local mycology society here. And I've also been sort of following this Yurok forager friend around here in Humboldt County and definitely have felt like a big divide between the white academy and POC foragers who are, um, you know, foraging to survive, support themselves, and have also felt in some of my conversations with um, mycologists that there is a divide between foragers um, and mycologists. And I'm wondering if either of you could speak to that at all. Um, I've, I've just noticed that very few of the conversations had in the mycology society have to do with community nurturing or, um, you know, some some skills around organizing that would seem so well suited for mushrooms. Mm-hmm. I think um, some of the, when you're asking about like mushrooms and abolition, um, 
I would like first like disclaimer, I'll say like this is something that is like new for me and I'm thinking of, I'm thinking about it. But the first thing, the first things that come to mind, well, the very first thing that came to mind for me was like, oh, like I was thinking about like mushrooms and how mushrooms like transform. Like, you know, they uh they transform like bodies that have died into like nutrients for other creatures, right? Or they transform plastic into something that's not so harmful for the environment. And that for me is like a direct connection to transformative justice. So like looking at the environment around us and like thinking of like, um, and building the like right, uh, like mushrooms didn't have the enzymes to break down certain things. They actually like encountered it, encountered things and then like developed enzymes for some things. Um, and for me, like this is like kind of like what the abolition is. Like we may not have all the tools to transform the world around us, but like, you know, we're encountering, we're being receptive to the encounters and we're building the tools. And we're always thinking about transforming perhaps, you know, with abolition, there's things that we cannot restore to the way, there's things that we cannot restore to the way they were like pre-colonialism, pre a lot of things, but there's, we can transform the situation and and be receptive to the world around. Um, so for me, that's one thing that has come to mind. The other thing is that um, I feel like one of the things as an organizer that I have come to, to to like, I feel like um, sometimes as an organizer, well, as an organizer who came from a very specific space who was organizing with abolitionist movements is that sometimes like the movements weren't so connected to like the environmental movement or the conversation wasn't as intersectional. And for me, like a, um, like thinking through the mushroom, how the mushroom is always in conversation with different spaces and different beings and like kind of making those beings communicate across each other sometimes too, uh, through chemicals that they're sending through the mycelium or through food or nutrients and different things. Um, for me, I feel like how can I, how can I as an organizer like embody the mycelium, right? Like if I'm connecting the different social justice movements and especially like the environmental justice movement, I just feel like at this point, the urgency and also like it's so related to everything. Like prisons are some of the biggest like, you know, like producers of environmental like toxicities and like just also to people's bodies and minds too. like the the harm that they're having is like very much like real and like very much toxic. And for me, like for me, yeah, so thinking of this like metaphor of like how am I connecting these different communities and then like the third thing that has come to mind is also to like and this is tied to like what William was talking about is like um you know, how can we get people outside of like, like, uh, how can we get people to divest from like capitalist interest and like these like capitalist modes of like working and these capitalist modes of like being and like rather and like producing like, uh, like more shoes in the world or producing these things that it's like more cars and all of these things that, you know, like we do need some, we don't need a whole bunch. Like, how can we get people interested in people from that come from these communities that are like the most impacted by the prison industrial complex, like interested in mushrooms and working with mushrooms and like learning how to farm mushrooms and like learning how to like extract medicine from mushrooms. And, you know, and because a lot of times, like one of the things that we talk about uh, within the prison abolitionist movement is that like, you know, if you, a part of prison abolition is also getting people work. Sometimes like people, people steal, people do certain hustles because you know they need, they need, they need to eat, they need money, or they have a very precarious situation. So I think I'm excited about like the possibility of like, you know, work and like building work and livelihood around mushrooms and like more sustainable um situations rather than like these like capitalist objects of consumption and stuff like that. Um uh where do you, where do you live? Uh is Chi was it Chisa? I'm, I'm in Humboldt County. Oh, um, all right. It, uh, sometimes I think like once a year there's uh, they do the um POC fungi gathering, but that's in Southern California. Um but that yeah, I, I, I've been admiring POC fungi, but I I feel far away. Yeah, I mean, if you can ever make it to to that, that'd be probably one of the closer ones to you. Um, I know there's fungi for the people up in in uh, Eugene, Oregon, as as well. Um, and I think those are good people to connect with that are able to like really translate this on on a ground scale. Um, and as far as like 
like economic liberation through mushrooms is what I was hearing at the end of, of what Gloria was saying. It's like, whenever I started growing cordyceps mushrooms, I was selling them at $1,300 a pound dry. Um, it wasn't until some things unsavory happened that somebody dropped the price in half, but still at 800, 600, like now it's at 600, $800 a pound, a couple of years down the line. And that's still good money, like 600, $800 a pound uh, for a dry product. That's insane. Like that's almost unheard of anymore. Also, the truffle cultivation is getting um, particularly interesting and they're very expensive. So I think that there is um, a lot of opportunity of economic alleviation through mushrooms. And I don't even think it's all of it's through the cultivation of mushrooms. I think it's just the power of the mind. I mean, I taught myself how to do molecular biology in two months back in 2019. And the capabilities of what I know now with molecular biology makes me... Uh, um, like if I wanted to go out and make a lot of money with the skills that I have, be, it wouldn't be hard. And I can, and I was able to train my one buddy that also dropped out of high school to be able to do mycology and molecular biology. And he only has been working with me since November. So, I mean, if I think if I can do that for other people as well, and to make more people, make people more valuable in themselves, because like, I mean, I literally could, I, just, I helped my friend that's a high school dropout, learn how to do mycology and molecular biology in like four months. Like if I could do that with other people, I don't, I'm not asking anything of him. He's in here helping me as I teach him, he wants to learn and he's helping me get more work done than I can even get done. You know, if I put my, I feel like if I put myself in a more public setting and I'm able to do this with more people, I could be sending heck, like lots of people out into the world with, with real world skills. And, I, and I'm like, it's not, I'm not the only person that could be able to do this. It just needs to be reasonable for other people to be able to share this kind of stuff. Cause like people don't even want to share this kind of stuff because they're like, I learned something. I'm going to make a bunch of money off of it for the rest of my life. You know? Um, yeah. I think one of the things I appreciate about your practice is that like, I feel like you very much to the forefront talk about like training people on how to grow their own mushrooms and like training specific communities to do this. Um, and yeah. And just like thinking about that, I had like this wild like dream. I was like, Oh my God, how, how do we get money to bring William to the Chuco's justice center? And like, training like the youth from this continuation high school called free LA high school because I was just like super excited but yeah I really appreciate that I I haven't met other mycologists or uh encountered the work of other mycologists where they actively so much like in, to the forefront of their practice like talk about like we need to train people and like be intentional on how we're like spreading this and to whom and just everything yeah you just made me think that I feel like I need to teach teachers. <laughs> yeah. Because I can't be all those places that everybody wants me to be anymore. Yeah, leaders. No you shouldn't be able to teach that stuff. And teach organizers, I think, mm -hmm. part of that point. Organizers, yeah, that's a great point, yeah. Leaders don't create followers. They create more leaders. So uh, we're a little after six. Um, I mean, we started a little later, but... Um, if anybody has any more questions, uh, there's one in the chat. Somebody's curious about myco remediation. Uh, I don't know if that's a long answer or yeah, it's a long one. It's a long one. Yeah. <laughs> well, if you can point that person to where they could find out more, that'd be great. Um, Organic mushroom farming and micro remediation by Trad Cotter. It's a book. I'll put it in the chat. Please put it in the chat. And I have a question, like, is there any sites in LA that are doing like uh, micro remediation experiments or near LA or in Cali that you, like any labs or like folks that are working around that that you recommend? Um, I do not know. California is really interesting for mushrooms. I, I feel like I don't really know that many mushroom people down there. Or just uh, throughout the States, like a site that you recommend like their research. For micro remediation? Yeah. Uh, I'm not tapped into that world right now. Um, I have some friends down in the Amazon out in Ecuador working with like some crazy Exxon oil spill stuff down there, but um, um, yeah. And Paul Stamus, like in his mycelium running book has like a lot of information around that too. Yeah. It's just like, it's like one thing I'll say for people interested in micromediation is it's like, it's not plug and play it's environmental based. So just because somebody got results somewhere with something doesn't mean that you're going to get the same exact results where you are because you live in a different environment and there's different factors. 
Um, so that's something to stay and keep it, keep in mind. Um, but yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah. Really this. yeah. Thank you, William, so much. Thank you, Gloria, for thinking of William. And thank you all for being here and asking questions and just listening. This is so fascinating. And uh, I know that we're all going to walk away thinking about mushrooms for a long time and hopefully forever. So thank you all for coming. And uh, that's all. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Gloria. Thank you, William. Much love. Oh, we had someone from Mexico. Wow, how fascinating. Cool. William, I need your co more contact info. <laughs> I got you. I got you. Yeah. Everybody's leaving. Yeah. Everyone's saying thank you in the chat. If you can thank see you. the waterfall of thanks, it's mm -hmm. nice. All right. I'll be in touch. Much love. All right. Yes. Peace. Oscar, anything that you need to check in or we're good to go? We're good to go. It's always okay. funny. Zooms are so weird. You have to like stop all of Everybody, yeah. your speakers, but um, we'll be in touch. Yeah, sounds See good. Tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Okay, great. I'm looking forward to seeing you tomorrow. Whoever's Bye. around LA, hope to see you soon. Yeah. Bye. Bye, everybody.